This is a U.S.-China media brief produced by the UCLA Asian American Studies Center. Intellectuals at, at Beijing. So, destroy the four olds was one of Mao's slogans. Old habits, old customs, old culture, old this, old that. Destroy the four olds. And yet, when the Red Guards went to Tiananmen to praise Mao Zedong, they said, Seven characters per line. <laughs> Using one of the four olds in order to praise the person who was telling them not to uh, have anything to do with the four olds. I give you this example to illustrate my point that these cultural habits are, are deep and not, only, not even noticed. I doubt that the Red Guards noticed, or even that Mao noticed, that one of the four olds was being used in, in praise of the chairman. I would argue that the biggest damage to this cultural habit about values that's deep in Chinese tradition, the deepest damage in the uh, late 20th century came from the, the cynicism that resulted when the socialist enterprise collapsed with the Great Leap Famine and the Cultural Revolution. Really, it started with the anti-rightist movement in 1957 people stopped taking the ideals of socialism because the ideals of socialism had filled this sort of gap of what we need in order to have daily life values that we share and know that others share. But with those Maoist catastrophes in the 60s and 70s, uh, the language became uprooted. It became an empty shell and people became cynical about it and started to manipulate the language of ideals simply to get what they wanted in a practical sense and instead of relating to the values that they were supposed to contain. I'll give you just a quick example of this. When I lived in China in 1979-80 on the campus of Zhongshan University in South China and made friends with a professor in the Chinese department who lived in a tiny apartment and he wanted a bigger apartment. And Party Central had recently sent down instructions that intellectuals had been mistreated, so now they should have better treatment. So he went to ask for a bigger apartment. But instead of going to his party secretary and saying, I'd like a bigger apartment, he had to say, Could we pull down to earth the policies of party central with respect to intellectuals. In other words, he had to play this language game in order to get what he wanted. And how much does he relate in a you know, heartfelt sense to the ideals that are in that language? Not at all. And you can't blame him. He's using the language differently. Uh, my friend, the Chinese writer Liu Binyin, called this in a famous essay, Two Kinds of Truth. That, um, came into Chinese society from the late 50s on. Uh, well, where does this leave values now, daily life values, after this language bifurcation happens? Uh, today, I think, if you look at China and you generalize broadly, and now I have to apologize to the people that study contemporary Chinese series, <laughs> but uh, I would say there are two. One is materialism of the kind that Tony Judd decries, and one is nationalism. Uh, materialism measuring success by money and stuff, or as Judd puts it, confusing value with price. Nationalism I call narrow nationalism that we see in China today, because it's not the kind of deep, and rightfully deep, pride that earlier generations of Chinese had in their resplendent civilization of many kinds. But it's a thin, chauvinistic kind of nationalism that carries a rivalrous edge to it, uh, based not so much in, in genuine pride, I think, as insecurity, uh, most proudly expressed in things like shining skyscrapers in Shanghai or medal counts at the Olympics and so on. Now, I'm going to argue that neither of these two values, materialism or narrow nationalism, is nearly adequate to fill that 
area of vacuum that I talked about a moment ago. The place that calls for ethical values that I can use myself as a guide in life and rely upon that others will be using as well. So broadly, I agree with the Chinese intellectuals who've talked about a values vacuum. And for a moment, I want to unpack that metaphor a little bit. Uh, vacuum means that nothing is there. And I don't think that's literally true. I mean, it's never true that there's no values around at all. It means a paucity of values. But the other part of the metaphor implies this is sucking action. There isn't something there, but the culture wants there to be something. So there's this pull to look for values, and that's why I use the word quest in the title of this talk, Quest for Values in, in, in Contemporary China. Uh, now to treat this question properly of the values vacuum and what's happening, one would have to address two other uh, major questions, and I'm, we don't have time to do it, but I want to acknowledge them in passing. Uh, and we can talk about them in the question period if you like. One is the revival of religion, and the other is the problem of government repression of anything that looks like an organized ideology. By religion, I mean the comeback not only of Taoism and Buddhism and other popular religions, including new hybrids like the Falun Gong and so on, but the you know, almost explosive growth of Christianity in recent times, both Catholic and Protestant both in government-approved churches and so-called house churches, underground. Uh, but I, we don't have time to go into all of that. On repression, I mean the pattern of repression that shows how the Communist Party of China's most fundamental aim is not really control of belief, per se, anymore. In the Mao era, you could argue that it was, but not now. Or even the expression of belief in speech or the press, even so much as organization. Anybody who has even a small organization that the party doesn't control or know that it easily could control gets crushed. Falun Gong is a primary example of this, but there are many, many others. And interestingly in this too, we don't have time to go in right now, but we can talk about in questions if you like, the control of the internet where People are physically dispersed, but there's a kind of potential for virtual organization that actually can form unauthorized groups in a virtual sort of sense. And it's how that's repressed is a complex and different topic. I, neither of these two are going to be my topic. I want to use the rest of my time to talk about what I promised 20 minutes ago, looking at popular culture, fiction, television, blogs, jokes, and so on to look for evidence of this thirst for, sucking action toward, if I can use that phrase, uh, decency in daily life. And usually we have to look at these indirectly. They're not things that people preach about in an explicit sense. But I like to study them by looking at behavior in cultural products. Uh, both positive and negative examples of how values are upheld or violated. And with your permission, I want to make just one more methodological detour before I start that part. And that's to say that in using the products of popular culture in order to study values that, after all, are inside the minds of the populace, readers and viewers and so on, I'm making claims about what's in people's minds, not just what's on the piece of paper, and how can I do that? I'm making some assumptions, and I just want to be explicit with you about them. The preceding copyrighted program is a property of the University of California, Los Angeles. All rights reserved. It may be used freely for educational and not-for-profit activities. For other uses or to make an inquiry, please contact the Asian American Studies Center at UCLA.